Okay, so good evening, everyone, again. Um, I thought this, this would be better done via a voice note than typing a very lengthy story. In any case, like I said in the introduction, I'm going to be sharing a free ebook at the end of this that, that details this story that I'm about to share in a better way than I could have shared it in so short a time. That said, I'm Joseph. Um, uh, as Pastor Eze said, I'm, I'm in the United Kingdom. I'm 31 years old. I'm married. I've got two kids, two boys. One is going to be three next month. The other is going to be one next month. So married in 2016 at the age of 27. Um, but the interesting thing really is, is I just thought uh, some of you might probably have stumbled upon the story of, of um, our marriage. I mean, and probably this is our first time of just getting into each other's world, which is fine. Because um, I married my wife on the day that she was graduating <laughs> um, at Birmingham City University from a law degree program. So we got, we got married on the same day that she did her graduation. And that kind of made what was supposed to be a quiet wedding a popular wedding of some sort, both here in the UK and in Nigeria, the news was flying around and things like that. And we didn't plan for that unnecessary publicity, um, but it so happened. And because of that, I've 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 gotten quite a number of invitations to from young people, like platforms of young people like these, where I've got to dig into our love story to share some of the things that God has helped us to learn. Um, in that four and a half years of journeying through courtship together. And so, yeah, it's part of those that I'll be sharing today. And I'll go as far back as the very first day I, I met my wife. So um, I studied in Nigeria 2005 to 2010, February, microbiology. That was my first degree. Um, and I, I was posted to the north to serve during um, what we call the NYSE. Many of you would be aware of what that is. Um, I was posted to Gombe State in the north, um, March 2011. And as I started the program, I was, um, I joined NCCF, which is like the Christian Fellowship of Young um, Youth Corp, Corp members, or Corpus as we call them in Nigeria. And I was the state's Bible studies secretary. And by virtue of my leadership position, myself and the rest of the leadership team, we have to go to the NYC camp when subsequent batches came. So we were all batch A. We, we went in March. There's another batch that comes in July, which is batch B. There's another batch that comes in October, November-ish, which is batch C. So during batch B, we were going to the camp every single day to organize fellowship and stuff. And one of the days we've just finished having a Bible study, which I led. And then I stood at the back of the hall and I felt like, I felt like God spoke to me. And I mean, that's a big deal for some of you. That's uh, something that is just so common for some other people amongst you, probably. Um, but when I say God spoke to me, it's not like I heard a voice. Basically, what that looks like for me, and I'm able to pick it because that's not the first time that would happen. Um, but what that looks like for me oftentimes is that um, there is a thought that comes to my mind that is kind of superimposed upon my own normal thoughts. And because I know I wasn't thinking about that, oftentimes I know um, that it is God. It comes with a sense of peace. It comes with a sense of, um, sometimes with a sense of urgency. Um, but I have trained myself over time to discern when it is not me that is thinking about something, but the thoughts that has been impressed upon the, it, upon my mind by God. So that was how this came. And that thought came for me to look back that there is, um, of course, there is a book stand at the back of the hall. And that thought came to look back to that book stand and meet my next friend. That was how it came to me, as it were. And I looked back, indeed, there was a book stand, of course, and there was a lady standing alone by the book stand watching the books. Um, and I walked over to the lady, not knowing exactly where this is going. Of course, I had no thoughts or no uh, plans for getting into a relationship in my service here. That was the last thing on my mind. Um, I believe that I had a plan, and according to the plan that I thought I had and agreed with God <laughs> about, marriage or relationship was not going to come into the picture for another couple of years. So that was the last thing on my mind. I went to this table and met this lady. And as I was trying to, you know, chat up with her again, I was also trying to ask God without opening my mouth, of course, that God, what's this about? Why are you saying this is my next friend? What is it that you want me to do in her life? And vice versa. But I wasn't getting anything really. Um, but as I was at the book stand, I remember that when I was in camp three months earlier, in March 2011, I bought a book. Um, 
in camp from that same book stand mm -hmm. the book was titled i loved a girl and it was written by one man his name is walter trubbish and so i thought okay if i don't know what god wants me to do in the life of this girl at least let me buy a book um and so i started looking for that particular book but i didn't find it but luckily i found another book by the same author um another book which i had not even read myself and the title of that second book was i married you and so I thought, anyways, even if I've not read I Married You, I, I read I Loved a Girl. Uh, but the man writes this beautifully. So I thought this will also be a very good book. So I decided to buy that book for this lady. And then she looked at me, looked at the title of the book I'm buying for her, someone that is meeting you for the first time and is buying you a book, a guy that is meeting a lady for the first time and is buying the lady a book titled I Married You. I mean, that's that's kind of fishy you know and suspicious so i tried to clarify and make a note honestly i have i have no hidden agenda i'm just buying this because the one i wanted to buy is not available and i thought you would enjoy any book written by this man and so i bought the book for her what i didn't know was i've just prophesied <laughs> what is going to happen indeed eventually four and a half years later or about five years later from 2011 i married her but here's the story of how that unfolded and of course um, prior to this time i think at that time i was probably 21 years old or 22 ish maximum i think i was 21 20 or 21 um and at the time i had never had a girlfriend all my life i had never been in a relationship quote and unquote of course i had many lady friends or friends that were feminine and that we were quite close both in uni, in secondary school days and all that, but there was never anything, um, I've never asked anyone, can you be my special friend <laughs> in that kind of sense, if you know what I mean, what you guys would call dating. I never dated anybody. And likewise, she herself has never had a boyfriend. She's not dated anyone and all that. And I'm not saying dating and all those kind of relationships are um, automatically wrong. Um, it's got its own place and we'll get to, the, to that point shortly. I would, I would share my thoughts on that shortly. Um, but basically, I met this lady, I bought her a book. I think I'll pause here and start a second audio that would continue the story so that this doesn't get on. So the story continues. I Now we've met each other, we've exchanged contacts, we know each other. And again, you know, this is a, a, a friend that I believe God led me to make. And so I kept going back to God to say, God, what's up with this lady? What do you want me to do? Again, um, this is not the first time God would direct me to make friends with someone. He's done that many times. That's why I could easily pick it when he came again after that Bible study and God is saying. So when God leads me to someone, be it a guy, a girl, what I'm always after is, God, what's going on? What do you want me to do? Or what do you want me to learn? Or what is it that you want this person to do in my life or vice versa? I know there is always a purpose for every relationship, which by the way, would be one of the principles that we'll be drawing on. And so I kept going to God, God, what's up? And for, instance, for, for the next couple of weeks while the camp thing lasted, I never got anything concrete. But um, in a curious series of events, she found herself in the state capital in, and she started living in the same Corpus Lodge where I was living in the uh, NCCF Corpus Lodge, we call it. We call it family house. And so we're living basically in the same compound. Um, and by this time, our friendship had gotten a little bit more intimate. Um, the fact that I'd struck some sort of relationship with her back in camp made it easy for her to kind of open up to me and we could continue being friends, basically. And then the fact that I was Bible study secretary also means that uh, there are always avenues for us to interact because she joined the Bible study unit at some point and things like that. Okay, so <laughs> then came this very weird morning in july august ish 2011 when i had a dream um, i won't go into the details of the dream but basically i had a dream woke up went to fetch water to have my bath before going for the morning devotion and everything that happened in the dream that i had just woken up from started repeating itself literally like it was midway into that that i realized oh wow this is just the dream that i've just woken up from and it happened exactly as I saw it in the dream. And of course, it has everything to do with this lady being the one. Two things made me wave it off. One, I like I said, I wasn't ready. That, wasn't, that was the last thing on my agenda. Uh, getting into a relationship was the last thing on my agenda. Secondly, 
um, I think I've gotten to a point, of course, like you heard, my name is Joseph um, and I dream a lot. So even if I sleep for five minutes, I'll have a dream. So I've gotten to a point where dreams are just, they're just dreams, basically. I don't read any special meanings to them. Of course, there are times I have significant dreams and I know that the message is significant and I get it. But I've also learned um, in my spiritual work with God that dreams wouldn't be the best way for you to be guided by, by God. Because just as God could bring a dream to you, the devil could bring a dream to you. And so um, I, when I receive dreams that seemed to be significant, I wait on God for confirmation before acting on them. But in this particular instance, one, the, I wasn't ready. Two, it was a dream. So I could wave it off, even though the dream was literally fulfilled. And then three, I, I, the lady in question doesn't look like my mental picture of what my wife should be like. Okay, so those three things kind of ruled it all out. But eventually I went to the morning devotion that morning. Someone preached, led us to the book of Daniel chapter two. And as we was reading the text that I wanted to preach from, there was a phrase in the text where God said to Daniel, um, the dream is true. I think it was actually Daniel speaking to King Nebuchadnezzar, one of the kings that had to interpret the dream. The dream is true and the interpretation is certain. I think that was Daniel 245. And those words jumped at me as I was reading from my Bible that day. And I was like, God, what are you, what are you doing with me? I don't, I don't seem to get this. Um, but eventually, of course, um, I started exploring these thoughts that, okay, could there be something in this that God is actually trying to get my attention for? But what really make it difficult for me to align myself with what God is trying to tell me? was the fact that I had mental pictures. I had a list in my mind of what my wife should look like. And I've heard many people talk in relationship circles, say, go and write down all the qualities you want in your wife, what complexion she should be, how tall or short she should be, a shape and this and that, a character, virtues. And when you see a lady that meets all those things, you know that's the one. Okay, while that sounds cool and smart, I've learned over time that you can only do that on the assumption that you know what is good for you. But I've lived long enough to know that I don't know what is good for me. Very many times when I've taken decisions out of my best calculation and knowledge and wisdom as a person, considering all the facts and say, this is the best way to go. I have found out many times that what I thought was the best way to go wasn't the best way to go. And so I know that there is someone that knows me more than I know myself, and that's God. And so when it comes to making decisions in life, this is not just about marriage, practically about any decision really that is um, significant. There is always, and, and the good thing is we've got the help of God to leverage on to make those decisions. So God is always there to say, I've got your back. This is the way, <laughs> walk therein. And so that's why, um, I, 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 that's one of the things I learned basically in this stage of my life. Uh, the thing that I thought I had cooked up as mental pictures weren't looking like what God was bringing my way, but I had to give up my mental pictures to embrace the will of God. And when I did that, when I came to this point that, okay, I think I've accepted the fact that she's the one. God started throwing all sorts of unsolicited confirmations my way. Destiny friends were reaching out to confirm what God was saying to me. Uh, my assistant at the time reached out to give me some very incredible, and you read all about this in the book, by the way, some very incredible confirmations about what God was saying to me. And he had no idea what was going on in my mind, in my prayer halt and things like that. And so I kept getting all these confirmations that further reinforced my conviction that, okay, this is what God really wants me to do. Even though I feel unready for it, even though I feel like this is the wrongest time, this is what God wants me to do. And then that leads me to the next point, which is the next audio that I had to cross before eventually the relationship started. And that's what I will share in the last audio. Um, and so here's the third and hopefully the final part of, of trying to give you an introduction into my love story. So after I've gotten all of this, and by the way, this is me speaking from the masculine side of this story. My wife had a home version and she has a whole chapter in the first part of the book where she fully unpacked what all of this looked like from her own end of things. Um, so I would leave 
those that might be interested in that to to read that up from the book because she also had her own challenges she had her own suspicions she had her own god was dealing with her as well saying stuff to her letting her know what was going to happen and what is happening and things like that she also had her own doubts and reluctances just like i had mine but at the end of the day both of us came together but i said when i came to that point where i have agreed with god i've received all sorts of confirmations then i thought the holy spirit wanted me to inform my parents before opening my mouth to go and tell the lady would you marry me we call that proposal right um and so before <laughs> before i did um uh, before i proposed basically i thought okay let me let me share this with my parents by god's grace i've got godly parents god fearing parents as long as i can remember when i was still like in primary school i've always had them pray about the relationship the marriages of each of their children so this is not i know that whatever would be their opinion about this is quite significant and i don't know what the holy spirit was up about in saying i should say it to them before asking the lady but i think it's a way of honoring them in a sense and so i decided to call my parents and told them okay so there is this girl that i've that i believe god wants to lead me to ask for a hand in marriage and i thought you should know about it and they said okay they asked some few questions about her they said okay they will take some time to pray they'll get back to me about it and in a couple of weeks or so, they got back to me and said something totally different from what I believe God was saying. And this is an interesting bit. It's a unique um, chapter in our story, which may not necessarily many people would pass through, but I know quite a number of people that God has brought my way that is journeying through that, uh, journeyed through that, and God has helped us to unpack our own story to help them to navigate that phase. But what did that look like for me? So my parents came and said, is she the only one? Don't worry. We believe God will bring you something better. And I felt really, really confused initially. And then, of course, I went back to God. And this is the beauty in God being the author of your wedding story or your marriage story. Because if you are the one that cooked it all up, if you are the one that did all the searching for yourself and found something, and then your parents, for instance, say no, who do you go back to? You don't go back to God to, to talk about what God did not give you in the first instance, if you get what I mean. But because I was persuaded that, that this is of God, I went back to God and could talk to him about it and say, God, I thought I understood what you were saying to me. So what's going on? What's with this confusion? And God said to me, don't worry, <laughs> this is going to be a long journey, but just wait it out and let me lead you on by the way. And of course, leading me on by the way for the next four months there about why this period of my parents' stubborn refusal. And when I say stubborn, I'm not saying that dishonoredly, but they were insistent on the fact that no, she's not the one and she's not the one and we're not giving our blessing to this. Um, but in the four months why that lasted, what God did was leading me to people um that were giving me counsel and insights that were reaffirming the things that god has said to me um i met with my mentor not physically i sent him an email and then he responded he encouraged me he linked me up with another person there in gombe state as well who i went to visit spent the night in his house is a is an anglican priest um and he shared his own story which was very much like what i was going through at the time and um, also ministered to me, encouraged me, gave me some tips. I met with a particular brother that we were serving together, but I've noticed that he seemed to, to be a sort of mentor to this lady in question. And so I reached out to him, told him what was going on. He also gave me some sort of an assignment and, and stuff. In other words, I was in the multitude of counsel. And these are not just any kind of counsel. These are people that are spiritually matured and they helped me through that phase. Um, and then after four months, Ish, God said to me, okay, now is the time to go back to your parents to represent the issue. But this time around, um, I want you to go to them and tell them, okay, fine, you're ready to let this lady go. You're ready to not pursue this relationship. But you want them to tell you what exactly is it that I told them <laughs> that is making it impossible for this relationship to go ahead so that you can take that as a point of prayer not so that you can go ahead to marry her, but so that whoever will eventually marry her will not have to wrestle with the same thing. 
see the wisdom and of course now looking back in retrospect it sounds like wisdom at the time it sounds like god is telling me you are not going to marry this girl and of course because i've embraced i've come to this point of personal conviction i've received all these confirmations i've gotten to a point where i have quote and unquote fallen in love without actually being in a relationship if you know what i mean and so for god to bring this kind of weird counsel at this time it felt like god was cheating me out of what he has promised me and done good before my face and i wept through the night that that particular evening but in any case i believe that god knows best and he will never be boxed in a corner and he will always give us what's best for us and so i decided to go ahead and do exactly as he told me called my parents the next day told them okay fine i'm 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 okay to let go of this relationship but can you tell me what god said so that I can pray with it, so that whoever will be the one that will marry this girl eventually would not have to wrestle with the same issue. And I said all of that with humility. I said all of that with sincerity. They could sense the sincerity in my voice. And I was surprised when my dad paused on the phone and said, um, you know what, give us another couple of weeks. We'll get back to you about this. We want to go and pray again. And indeed, they went back to pray again, came back in two weeks and said, we, we, you have a blessing, you can go ahead. The very same day, I called the lady, took her on a walk, and 6.30 p.m. on Good Luck Jonathan Road in Gombe State, I popped the question, are you ready to walk into the future together with me? Blah, blah, blah. The future that I don't know, by the way. <laughs> Anyways, that's, that's it. That was proposal done, and that's how the relationship started. So in the next clip, I'm going to share just a few principles and then we can take some questions and answers. The principles. Um, again, you discover that one thing that came through from this story that I've shared, and this is not just from, I've only shared my side of it, but likewise from my wife's side, is the fact that um, both of us had learned to hear God um, from the very beginning, like growing up, we have prioritized our relationship with God. Many people wait till they get to this point where they are beginning to ask, okay, God, um, I need to get into a marital, in marital related relationship or whatever language you want to use for it. And that's when they start wanting to hear God. If you are not able to hear God about every simple little decisions you are making now, it will be difficult for you at that point because the severity of the decision you want to make would make you push you into all sorts of things. I've seen people go to pastors and prophets with names and say, these are the four girls I'm considering, which of them is the one? And they are waiting on someone else to make that decision on their behalf by virtue of that other person's direct link supposedly with God. It doesn't work that way. You need to come to a point where you are able to understand that you have direct access to the father he is your father god doesn't have grandchildren he only has children jesus christ as as grand as he is in the scheme of things is is your brother bible calls him the firstborn amongst many brethren and we are those brethren we are the brothers and sisters of jesus and so god only has children he doesn't have grandchildren you have as much access to him as any other child of God, as any other high ranking pastor that you might think of, you all have access. So, and the good thing is he wants to talk to you. He wants to, he wants you to know how he communicates with you. And when he sees that you are open and sincere enough to know it, he comes to your level and begins to communicate with you. For some of us, that will look like a bit of try and error in the first instance. I, I remember being in the university, living in the same room with Pastor Eze in my first year in uni. And, and I mean, these were the days of being a baby Christian in a manner of speaking. And God would give me some crazy instructions sometimes, which I would think, what sense is there in doing that? For instance, going out of the hostel and God says, take the right instead of the left or take the left instead of the right exit. And you're wondering whether I take the right or take the left, I will get out of the hostel and get to where I'm going. But, you know, I will still yield to those little, simple and somehow seemingly foolish instructions, not knowing that God was training me to understand how he communicates with me so that when I'm in a more precarious situation or something that is more dire i can still lean in back into that voice that is always there saying this is the way work there so that's one two is to understand that there is always a purpose to every relationship 
I, I don't, I mean, I've seen too many people while away, uh, waste away, um, squander what was supposed to be a very fruitful relationship that has nothing to do with marriage. But because they are always, oh, is, is he the one? Is she the one? That's always all that is in their mind. God wants, there is a purpose basically for every relationship. The relationship you have with your friend that is of the same gender with you or of a different gender with you, there is always a specific purpose. And we should develop that habit of asking God. When God is bringing someone into your, your sphere or, or making someone catch your eye, um, sometimes indeed it will be the fact that a lady is beautiful as a guy that first of all gets your attention. But before you start thinking that that is to say she might be the one you'll marry, no, pause and ask God, what's the purpose for this attraction? What's the purpose for, what's drawing me beyond the physical, beyond the, the way she talks, beyond whatever it is that I'm seeing? What is it that you are trying to bring both of us together to accomplish? When you've settled that, it helps you to maximize that relationship without abusing the sense of integrity that you need. And that's a very fundamental thing. So for me, when God said, look back at that book stand, that's your next friend. I didn't mistake that to mean that's my next girlfriend or that's your wife or whatever it is. What I heard was friend. And therefore I started asking God, okay, so what's, what's the purpose of this friendship? And indeed we became friends before we became whatever it is that we have become now. And we're still friends anyways, in the sense that God wanted me to actually be friends with her and address some issues in our, in our life, in our family as a friend. And all of this was going on before the whole idea of relationship ever crept in. And so I fulfilled that purpose as a friend before God said, okay, you've been faithful in this area. Now let's move on to the next chapter. And then it begins to, you know, switch the gears as you, if you will. So that's the second point. And the third point that I will leave us, leave us with um, is to say that the whole idea of marriage, because this is this is the big deal. Um, the whole idea of marriage is based on this simple principle of being naked and not ashamed. Genesis 2, the last verse ends with saying that Adam and Eve were together in the garden and they were naked and they were not ashamed. Of course, the next chapter, chapter 3, is where they fell, they disobeyed God, and they lost <laughs> the life of God as it were that they had. And the um, Bible says the first thing that happened as a result of that fall was their eyes were opened and they saw that they were naked. So now they are naked <laughs> and ashamed. God's agenda is to, is to bring us to a point where we can be naked and unashamed with one another. But that now only happens in two places. One, in the presence of God, and two, in the institution of marriage. In the presence of God, you can be naked. And when I say naked, I'm not talking of physical nakedness. I'm saying you can be bare. You can let God know what's going on with you without filter, without all these Instagram filters that we label or use to shade and hue and paint our lives. God knows you more than you know yourself. So there is actually nothing you want to tell him that is breaking news. <laughs> he knows already. And so you can be naked with him and not ashamed, knowing that he is always gracious and it will always be there to help. Likewise, in the, in the sphere of marriage institution, we are coming into marital relationships, knowing that both of us are works in progress. And so we can still be naked with one another, not physically, of course, until after the marriage, <laughs> um, but naked in the sense that you accept the person the way he or she is, as both of you continue to journey together to become more like Christ and not being ashamed of that. So my wife knows I've got my flaws. I know she's got her flaws, but we still choose to accept each other, one another in, in our entireties, including our flaws and mistakes, knowing that the God that has made us for one another also accepted us in the beloved, irrespective of our flaws. And that's a very key principle. I can't begin to unpack that, but that's a very key principle for us to hold on to. Lastly, and lastly, I just thought to, to say a word on dating. Like I said, I never dated, and I will tell you why. Um, I, I learned very early enough in my Christian journey to understand that um, rather than putting intimacy, because I, I believe dating is all about pursuing intimacy, 
marriage is all about pursuing or is founded on commitment what drives dating is intimacy i want to be intimate with this person even to the point of i want to be physically intimate i want to be sexually intimate and you're attracted to someone and you just want to continue to fuel that intimacy both of you are dating one another going out bringing out putting forward your best impressions of one another so that the person can like you um at the end of the day you get to a point where you start wondering trying an error okay okay maybe she's the one okay maybe she's good enough but maybe, oh but she doesn't do this well she doesn't do that well it comes to a point where you become you discover you the, the skills fall off or whatever and then you discover okay this cannot go ahead and then you cut that off you join yourself to another person and start the whole cycle all over again it's it's flimsy but marriage what if there is an opportunity or another option rather whereby you can start off from the basis of commitment the commitment that you have chosen to wait for in the context of dating to say okay let's first of all date try 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 and see whether we can be committed what if that commitment can start can be the foundation and then you go on from there to now say now that we are committed to go together in this journey now let's see how we can begin to build intimacy on the foundation of that commitment that's the option i went for i chose to put all my eggs in one basket and give the baskets to god rather than scatter my eggs around different baskets hoping that something would one of them would work out well now um, so that's that's the notion I want, I have, and that's my that's my challenge against dating. And of course, again, there is also this point of the fact that when you continue to date like that, date, break up, date, break up, you are programming yourself knowingly or unknowingly for divorce. The reason why divorce is very rampant is because many people that divorce they've dated and broken relationships to the point where they now always believe that there is always an escape button. And so they get into a marriage, it's not working. They do what they used to do when they were dating. Break it up and join yourself to another person. Whereas marriage, why you can do that while you're dating flimsily, in marriage context, it's a, it's a very severe thing. Of course, that's not to say divorce is the end of the world, but that's not God's plan. That's not God's design. That's not God's intention. God hates divorce because of what it does to the people that are involved and the children that comes forth from such relationships. And so um, I think with those three, four points, I've been able to capture some of the main things that I would have loved to share. Um, but if there are specific questions, I will be able to speak directly into that. And then the book that I'll be sharing at the end would hopefully help shed much more light on all this. God bless you all. Thank you very much. So question time, if there is any questions.